Good morning, City Church. Uh, welcome again. I'm uh, I'm torn giving the Lord's word this morning. It's been on my heart for over a month, but uh, last night as I fell asleep, and then the the Lord woke me up at four a.m. and uh, I just couldn't stop thinking about George Floyd and and Minneapolis, and then just the the brokenness of so many people around our nation. And found myself on Facebook this morning, just looking at people's responses, and, and my heart is just breaking. Uh, there is so much hate and divisiveness in our nation right now. And uh, we, as a people of God, uh, have to stand up and, and, and speak truth and speak love into these dark times and into these moments. And so um, I just wanted to start this message with just seeking the Lord concerning uh, those hurting, specifically in Minneapolis, those in our African-American community, our brothers and sisters, uh, fellow Americans who are just done with the injustice that they see, um, whether small and micro do doses day to day that, that I don't have to deal with or the outlandish injustice that they experience um, from time to time in other aspects of their lives. And so we just want to come together this morning just to pray for, for God's goodness on all people, not just for uh, for certain races uh, or belief systems in our nation, but this nation would be a place of peace. And so if you join me in prayer before we get into the word, um, let's just seek the Lord for his goodness over our land and for mercy to reign supreme. Father, I just, uh, I'm so, I'm just overwhelmed by the anger and hate that's been spread these last few weeks uh, and this entire coronavirus uh, unsettling of our nation how much divisiveness has come to making everything political to making everything a us versus them hear me hear me lord but there there are many who aren't being heard and lord we're just asking for your truth to prevail Lord, as you, uh, as you went to speak to the people that the trumpets got louder and louder at the base of Sinai, Lord, we're asking for your goodness and your mercy to get louder and louder over America, that people would hear the truth of how you restore, how you redeem, how you bring reconciliation. Lord, that is not by our violence, uh, and nor is it by our turning a blind eye and pretending it's not there, that neither one of these extremes, Lord, bring your justice, neither one of these extremes bring peace, Lord. And so, Father, help us, help us as your children, bearers of your light, your Holy Spirit, your power to, to be people who bring peace in the situations, in whatever our context is, Father, that we would be people who know how to speak and act and love in such a way that disarms uh, false pretense, that, that wipes away tears from people's eyes, that, that removes and helps uh, bring clarity to the, to the lies of what we have all fallen into, of how people should act and view and what we're entitled to and what we've been given and didn't deserve, Lord, that we would just be a people of humility. We come before you this morning uh, with the heart of what Solomon told Israel, that if we would come to this place, if we as your body would come, and humble ourselves and pray that you would heal our land. And Lord, we're just asking that you would do that. Would you heal our land? Lord, I just pray for George and his family and his loved ones. I pray for the police officers who with pure hands and pure hearts are doing the best they can in a crazy moment right now in their city. I pray for uh, the hearts around America that are being directly affected because they can feel so closely their own uh, discrimination that's happening against them f being brought right before their faces again in this time. And Lord, I just ask for just mercy and grace on every individual. And we just thank you, Jesus, that you are faithful and we give you praise. Amen. Um, it's interesting when we when we disobey God, this this sort of ex, our expectation shouldn't be much different than what we're experiencing as a nation right now. That chaos and calamity rule, that that death and and divisiveness reign supreme. And uh, being that it's Pentecost today, the day where the Holy Spirit came down on the church in Acts two, and just tongues as if fire rest on people, and they start speaking in different languages, and 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 the devout Jews who had come from all around the world who didn't speak Hebrew, many of them, they spoke the the native tongue of wherever they were raised. They were coming to Jerusalem to worship God as they were called to do on this feast. 
of Pentecost to offer their first fruits of the land, the, the first signs of life of the harvest year unto God and, and just celebrate in anticipation, almost prophetically saying, God, you've given me this much. I know you're going to give me more. And they came and they heard the voices of the 120 in the upper room, all speaking and glorifying God in their own language. And they were amazed. But this, this Pentecost, God is so good in, in, in showing us his goodness in the New Testament and how it, it, it unveils his intentions in the old. And so I want to take us back to when Pentecost began. And if we go back to Exodus 19, we're going to be in Exodus 19, uh, just in the very beginning of that. And I want to read to you guys a little bit about Exodus 19. And what's happened here is Israel has come out of Egypt. They've, the, the 10 plagues have happened. Israel's left Egypt. They've crossed, excuse me, they have crossed the Red Sea. And they're about 47 days, 47 days removed from when they had left Egypt. And then they come to this place and God calls Moses up on the Mount Sinai to speak to him about his covenant with his people. And so this is what the Lord says. Chapter 19 of Exodus, verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out to the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain while Moses went up to God. And the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you will say to the house of Jacob and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on wings of eagles and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord has commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. That's the end of verse 8. It's interesting. So this is what's considered uh, the first giving of the law. And it's really God just saying, hey, I brought you out and I will establish you. Obey what I'm about to tell you. And this is what's considered the giving of the law. It's the first sign of God showing his people exactly how he wants them to live. And this is what we celebrate at Pentecost. And this is what the Jews would celebrate still to this day is they would remember the giving of the law with great joy. If I want to find it, I find it interesting as God's been giving me these, these messages to share with us, how he's been building on similar themes over and over again. And I did not prepare this study over the course of this COVID thing. We've been just kind of taking in how to respond uh, to the crisis at hand with these messages as the Lord's been leading. But this morning, even at, at 4 a.m. when I was reading this, I, I, I found it so interesting that he said that I brought you out. I bore you on eagle's wings. And if you remember a few messages back, we talked about the word of God, the tassels on, on the rabbis that are called the kanaf. And it's the truth. It was the word of God that helped them remember every word of God. And the Lord is saying, I brought you out of Egypt based on my word, my truth. My promises always stand firm. I will always do what I say I do. And so there's this image of the wings of eagles rising above the circumstances, but there's this context of understanding that he brought them out based on the power of his word, the truth that he promised. And then he says something amazing that many of us know, and this is going to be one of the main verses in this message, and I think it needs to be one of the main verses for us as a church moving forward, and that's 1 Peter 2.9. In, in Exodus, first he said, I just want to remind us where he said, You shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This was God's intent for Israel. Now they end up sinning, and we'll get to that, and they didn't actually walk that out as a whole nation. Only the Levites get to represent that. But this was God's intent from the very beginning. And so we go forward into First Peter 2. The verse that I was telling you about that I think is something we need to consider as a church to really hold on to um, as a people. I find it here. And this is what Peter writing uh, to his, his fellow brethren, uh, the Jews, the Jewish brethren that he was leading. He says, they stumble. So this is verse 8, sorry. Verse 8 and verse 9 is what we'll read here in First Peter 2, 8 and 9. They stumble, talking about other Jews, because they disobeyed the word. God brought them out on the word, but they have disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But you, speaking to those who would receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Peter says to this, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own 
possession. How beautiful is that? That what God intended in the old, the, the old could not perform because it was based on us responding to God in our efforts. But in the new covenant that God brings us, he brings us into a relationship where he does the work inside of us to produce the promises, produce the obedience that he calls us to. This is an amazing, this is why it's called the gift of grace. It's unmerited favor given to us that we never earned. It's an amazing thing that God would, would set standards so high that no one could meet it and then you come down and meet it for us and give it to us as our credit how good is our God and he doesn't do that to rub it in our face he says no you're a chosen people I love you dearly you're a royal priesthood a holy nation you're my my prized possession that this is what he speaks to us in this time and it's interesting that we, as we look at this, is to see that how this all came about, that this Pentecost, that God spoke this promise that this is who you're going to be. And, and the Jews ended up disobeying. They ended up walking away from God and disobeying in fear and in selfishness and all sorts of prideful reasons. But in Acts, we see at this exact same time, in, in, a, in a chronological order from, from Passover to Pentecost, the 50 days of separation between the two, Moses gets Israel out of Egypt. And then 50 days later, God gives them the law. Jesus raises from the dead in the New Testament. And then 50 days later, Pentecost happens. And let's take a look and see what God did on his second time around of giving his covenant to his people, the new covenant. And so when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And it's about 120. It's the apostles, the 12 apostles, and probably Jesus's uh, immediate family and other people who had followed real closely, probably the Marys and Marthas and Lazarus, people of that nature who really devoted themselves to the Lord. And it says they were all in one place and suddenly they came from heaven, a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as if fire appeared on them and rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them ability. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews of many from what I told you earlier. And then they begin to speak. I'm going to move on down to verse 8. And how is it that each of us, all these different Jews from around the world, each of us hear our own language? Perithians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, can't say all these words, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome from all over the world. Both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And they were all amazed and perplexed. Which they were confused. They didn't understand what was going on. God is doing a new thing that no one had ever seen. These are Jews that had had a certain form of worship, a certain understanding of how God manifests in the temple, how he manifests and speaks amongst his people. And this is something completely new. And they said that it says that they're amazed and perplexed. And they said to one another, what does this mean? But others mockingly said they are filled with new wine. We have two options when God does something new is we can stop and go, God, what does this mean? Or we can mock because it's different than what we understand. Or we can judge and make excuses and use our natural thinking and going, this is new wine. But I want to suggest something today that what they were mocking as new wine, while they were mocking and it's not a credit to them, was actually a prophetic utterance of what God was doing. And I believe it's what God wants to do here in this day for us. You see, when Moses gave the law, what we read in Exodus 19, he then went back up on the mountain for 40 days to receive the tablets of stone and further instructions on the law. And when he came down, he found Israel dancing and singing and honestly whoring themselves amongst each other and worshiping two golden calves and, and God was angry and Moses sent out the Levites to find the perpetrators and 3,000 men died. And on Pentecost, when this happens, if we read on through, through Acts 2 a little bit farther, Peter preaches the gospel of repentance from old ways, from this old wineskin, from old ways of living, from living in your own efforts unto the grace of God to repent and receive Jesus, your king. And 3,000 people heard and received life. You see, the law of death brought death. The law, the law of God brought death for 3,000 people when it was initiated. But the law of spirit or the spirit of God in the new covenant brought 3,000 people to new resurrection life. And this is the difference 
that happens when God does a new thing, when we obey and we hear and we receive the word of the Lord, when he, we actually let him carry us on the wings of eagles, on the wings of his kanaf, of his truth. And so I want to look at this. They were drunk on new wine. I believe the Lord spoke to me concerning this, that in this season, as we've been talking about getting away from our complacency and our comfort of the old way of doing church, of the old way of being Christians, that God is doing a new thing in our heart right now. He's trying to speak to his bride saying, baby, I love you and I have better for you than what you're currently experiencing, but it's going to take a change that you're not used to. It's going to take a change that you probably don't want. It's going to take a change that's uncomfortable. It's going to take a change that will require you not to be complacent. It's going to take a change that's going to make you question what I'm doing because it won't be in your control and it won't be something you've experienced before. It will be like new wine. And it's interesting just in that very idea that they said they're drinking new wine. In other words, old wine, wine that every man drank, didn't get people to talk like this. This was wine, but it was something different than they had ever experienced. You know, if the new is really telling, because if, if they just thought they were just drunk, they would have said, oh, they're just drinking wine. But they said that they are drinking a new wine. There was a mysterious nature, an unexplainable nature to what they were experiencing. And drunkenness was the closest thing they could equate it to, but it wasn't accurate enough. So they had to say, it's some sort of new wine that these guys are drinking. And Peter gets up and denounces that and speaks of the... The, the new wine being that it's the new way of life, the new covenant through Jesus Christ. You see, they no longer were a people who had to go to the temple, obey the law by works and will, and go to the temple for the presence of God. They are now people who by faith received the power of God, became the temple, as, as, as our brother um, shared with us. Um, earlier this week, uh, Pat we talked about how God wants us to be the temple, that we are the temple with the Holy Spirit in us, that that's what Peter describes here in Acts 2 and Acts 3, is that, that God is now residing in people, that this is the new wineskin, that the new wineskin has to do with God living and manifesting through men, not through a room that's only hidden for one person to see one time a year. And so it is no longer a temple made of hands, but as a temple made of the Spirit of God within us that this new wine flows out of. And I, and I want to take us in this idea of new wine. I immediately was drawn to the parable of the new wineskins. And in Luke, Jesus gives, pro we probably get the most explanation and context of what new wine looks like. And I think it speaks directly to what God's already been speaking to us about Zarephath, that the land beyond it where Israel had never taken, but were promised to take, where Elijah went to a woman who was in the center of Baal worship, who wasn't a Jew, and he, he he brought life to her and her son, even resurrected her son from the dead. And we talked about how God is moving us into a season of going out to the least of these, to going out and spreading the gospel, that we will be fed, as God promised Elijah, by when we go out and give of ourselves to the spreading of the gospel and to the loving of people and the meeting of needs. And so... I want to take us back to Luke because I think God, again, very specifically brought me to this verse today to reinforce that idea. And I promise you that these were not things that I planned and meditated and tried to find. It's just the Lord kept giving me these insights and these verses. And then I would sit here as if I'd never read it before, blown away at how he's continuing to build his word for our future in, in such clarity that I've personally never experienced before as a leader in the church. I've had clarity like this in my personal life, but I've never had clarity like this as a leader before. And I just want to encourage us today to take a look at, at these verses coming up in Luke 5, 37 and 39. I'll read the verse and then I'll go back on a little context. Jesus says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst in the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. The new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new for he says the old is good. I think there's a warning here for us. We want God to do a new thing, but are we prepared to create a place in our heart and a place in our life that is new and different than what we're already accustomed to? 
And here's what the flesh says. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. We all, we all desire to have consistency, comfort, familiarity for things to go back. And we've been hearing this idea of the new, of, of normal, going back to normal, getting back to normal after this COVID-19 crisis. And I'm afraid, church, that what the Lord is doing in the church by pulling us away, giving us a, a fresh start, giving us our own uh, 70 days of fulfillment of time of just not being able to get together, that what the Lord has done in this season, is he said, look, I'm trying to give you a new wineskin. I'm giving you an opportunity like Peter gave the Jews of that day, a chance to repent as a church and to really see that God is doing a new thing. And God is doing something we don't understand. You see, when Peter preached, he used Joel that the old men and young men, women and, and boys would have visions and dreams. And he used that to describe the Holy Spirit manifesting as, as the preaching of the word in tongues. None of that in Joel has anything to do with speaking in new languages, yet Peter and the Spirit understands that the prophecy is fulfilled nonetheless because the Spirit of God is being poured out on people regardless of their social standing, regardless of their gender, regardless of where they were in their walk of faith. The Spirit of God is just being poured out. And so he uses this verse to prophetically declare that this has been fulfilled in this moment in front of all of them, even though the details of the prophecy and the reality of the moment don't seem the same. You see, when the Holy Spirit pours out through prophetic word and then we actually experience it often, what we think we heard and we imagine our natural mind for how it's going to manifest often doesn't look the same when it actually happens. This is why the Jews couldn't receive Jesus. They were expecting all these prophecies of God's justice and freedom to look a certain way and Jesus came giving the fulfillment of that word a different way and so they killed him for it. We as a church have to understand through the Spirit, which means we have to yield our heart, our prejudices, our preconceived notions of how God's going to move the church in prayer, in fasting, in seeking the Lord, and just waiting to hear His voice to give us direction, and waiting for Him to confirm, what is this? Like, like the good men out of the, the 3,000 who probably believed were the ones who probably said, what is this we're hearing while others mocked? If we find ourselves in mocking going, no, I just want to go back to the old church. This all seems crazy. I've heard prophecies before. I don't want to go that way. We can find ourselves on the outside of the move of God. And I'm begging us as a church to consider that these times God is speaking to his church at large. And I can speak from my own experience as I watch other pastors preach, as I've been online and YouTube and, and people have sent me certain things. I'm seeing a more cohesive and unified thought of the word of God than I have ever seen in my entire life. And that God is speaking consistently through his people in a way that I have never experienced. And so I just want to encourage us as we get into this next part of the word where I challenge us to consider what a new wineskin looks like, that we would take a deep breath and just go, okay, this might be uncomfortable. I might not understand. I might not like what I'm being called to. But if I want the goodness and the fulfillment of God's promises in my life, is this something that I can at least go to the Lord and go, okay, what is this that I'm hearing? What is this, Lord, and what does it look like to me? So Luke 5, we just read, you, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins. And yet for those of us who are accustomed to church the way it is, accustomed to our Christian walk being a certain way, accustomed to us maybe judging whether we are faithful to God and good Christians based on the judgment of other Christians in our own culture and not according to the word of God and what he's called us to, it is a time for us to sit and go, what is this new thing God's speaking and what does it look like for me to have a new wineskin? Let's get some context for Luke 5 here so that we can see what's happening in the context of what's going on and how this ties into the Zarephath and us going out for the new wine. If we go back to Luke 4, Jesus starts, Luke 4 starts us off uh, with Jesus being drawn into temptation. The Holy Spirit is descended. He goes in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and he comes back and he starts his ministry. And it says that he returned in chapter 4 verse 14 and 15. It says, he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit to Galilee and a report about him went throughout all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. So Jesus starts by going to the Jews and he goes to the religious place of teaching and he teaches in their synagogues. Now it's interesting what immediately follows. He goes home to where he's known best. 
And I think when we are too familiar with God and not in fear of the Lord, a holy fear of knowing that God does what God does and we should follow by faith. But when we get too familiar with the Lord and thinking that we know everything about him and he can offend us when he does things that we haven't experienced before. So in that context, I want you to look at what happens when he goes to Nazareth, the town he grew up in, the town that knows his mother, his brothers knew his father who has passed and knew him from a baby on, or at least about eight years old on. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue. He's still going to where people gather to worship. And he went on the Sabbath and he stood up and read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, which was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the tenant and sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did in Capernaum, do here in our hometown as well. Prove it, God, is what they were saying. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there are many widows in Israel. Remember, this is where he brings up Zarephath and the widow of Sidon. And this is what blew me away this morning. He goes, I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah. In other words, in Israel, in God's people, there are many widows who were dying of starvation. This is what the Jews would have understood. The Jewish ear would have understood that because of Ahab's uh, false worship of false gods in Israel falling after their leader and worshiping false gods and doing false things and abominations to the Lord. There was much drought in the land for three and a half years. And so they would have been hearing this going like, okay, so God was punishing us. This was the context they'd be hearing this story of Elijah. God was punishing us because of us running from God and worshiping other gods. He said, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath. Remember, this is enemy territory. It was the promised land of Israel that they never took because they settled on the east side of the river in complacency and comfort and didn't want conflict. They wanted to be able to control their destiny where things look good in the natural and not take the promises of God where they had to walk by faith. But only in Zarephath to the land of Sidon, a woman who was a widow, and there are many lepers in Israel in the name of the prophet Elijah. And none of them, and there were many lepers as well, he says, and none of them were cleaned. But only Naaman, the Syrian, this is a foreign king, a, a, a heathen king that comes, or a heathen general, I apologize, that comes, and he gets healed of leprosy, but none of the lepers in Israel did. And when they heard these things, the Senate were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of a hill, a cliff, in other words, on which there was a town built so that they could throw him down off the cliff. Look, he's... He's telling them that their religious mindset, that they, because they've been worshiping something other than the God, that God didn't move in their midst. And then it goes on as it, as it continues. It says that Jesus, you know, went and healed a man um, of a demon and he continued to preach in the synagogues. And then it changes real fast right before we get to the new wineskin. So I want you to understand there's this, this preaching in the synagogues. It's telling people, hey, your current wineskin, the way you think that God moves is just like the days of Elijah when Ahab was told that, that it would be the king would be ripped from his hands. He's, this is what they would have been hearing in their Jewish understanding of scriptures, that Jesus is saying, you don't have much time. You have to repent and turn away from the way in which you do worship because there is a new way. And then he does something crazy. He moves from the synagogues to the sinner's home. I think that's something for us to understand in this season. I believe the Lord right now, even in this moment speaking to us as a church, we have to move away from the synagogue, from the building and programs and into the sinner's home. We have to move away from the comfort and complacency of controlling how we worship and, and how we how we let our lives be um, integrated with the world and the lost. And we have to move into the context of the sinner, the context of the lost. And we have to be a people who engage them where they're at. 
And it says after this, he's been preaching in the synagogues. This is the first time we get a glimpse of him somewhere outside of synagogues teaching. And he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. In one of our devotionals the last couple weeks, Chris talked about this. These tax collectors were Jewish people who collected tax for Romans, the enemy. Not only that, they often raised the taxes pretty high so that they could live wealthy while they impoverished their own people. This was worse than being a Roman citizen to the Jewish people. This was, you were a betrayer of your own people. You were completely cut off from the people of God. This is one of the worst types of sinners the Jews looked at in their day. A tax collector wasn't just someone who got rich off their own people. They did it by betraying their people and helping their enemy get rich as well. They were hated. And it says, so he's done all the synagogue in the first place it goes to here. He says, after this, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. He didn't say, fix your life. He didn't say, give everything up. He just said, you come, follow me. And Levi, leaving everything, he rose and followed him. See, he understood as a Jewish man that when a rabbi, when a great teacher, when a man of authority called him and he had an opportunity to have a new life, that the only way he was going to follow him was to leave everything. You see, when God calls us, there should be the automatic response in our heart. The Holy Spirit does not leave us questioning what we should give up. He calls us to pick up our cross and to follow him, even without saying it. It should go without saying that if a God this amazing, this good calls me to follow him, and I have no reason left to stay in the life I'm currently living, that I need to be willing to give up everything to follow him even my old wineskin of how I worshiped. And so Levi holds a great feast. He's so thankful. He leaves his tax collecting career behind and he, and he spends great wealth and he invites all his friends because he's hoping that people like him now have hope for the first time. They are no longer outcasts and hated because this great Jewish rabbi, Jesus, has invited him to come follow him. And so he invites everyone and, uh, and, and the Pharisees come, right? Those who are in the synagogue, who teach in synagogues, they come and, they, and they're scribes and they grumble to Jesus' disciples. They don't even come to Jesus himself. They grumble to the disciples. It's like social media grumbling against the church. They won't come into our place. They won't have a conversation. They won't debate openly. They won't discuss why we do what we do, but they just grumble from the outside. And oftentimes... We do this to each other. We grumble against other churches who are doing radical things because we're looking at it from the outside and we grumble to sympathetic ears or ears without authority to do anything because we know we're safe to complain without the conflict of confronting the person who's called. And so we come and we grumble. And so they grumble to the disciples and they, and they say, why do you eat with and drink with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus answers them. Jesus knows what they're talking about. Jesus knows where our hearts are. And Jesus knows what we're talking about. And Jesus answers them saying, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Now you have to understand in the context of what he just did in Nazareth, they know he's speaking with a, a tongue-in-cheek sort of way. He's not calling them righteous and, and perfect. He's not saying that they're good and they don't need salvation. He's already declared that when he was in the synagogues before. He's calling them to their own self-righteousness. You think you're self-righteous, then I didn't come for you. If you think your programs, your synagogues, and what you currently have is good enough, then I can't speak to you at all, and you can't follow. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And then Jesus gives them the analogy of the wineskin. You cannot pour the Holy Spirit into, into old religious practices. Church, I believe God is doing a new thing. And when God gave me the verses in uh, 1 Kings 17 and the widow of Zarephath, I believe this is the time in which we are transitioning now, is this is the time for us to be a people of prayer, to pray for the land, that we would pray for healing in our land, but we'd also be people who go out into the brokenness of the places around us. And we would be like Jesus, that we would not think that it is good enough to build buildings and build programs and have people come to us. We are not the church of the field of dreams that if we build it, they will come. We are the people who are the body of Christ, the temple of God, and we go pronouncing the goodness of God everywhere we go. God's going to do a new thing in this season. He's doing a new thing already and where he's awakening his church to be the church again, for us to get back to going out, to having hearts for the lost, that when, when, um, 
when, when things happen, like has happened in Minneapolis, that our heart should break and it should break not just on social media with the post, but it should break in a way that we say make some practical change. And maybe it's not for social justice with racism, but maybe it's just for your neighbor. Maybe it's somebody you've seen that you know is just hurting and your heart breaks because it's, it, it's breaking over here. The context of your life, that brokenness, your heart opens you up with compassion to be able to release the goodness of God somewhere else around you. And God is calling us to a time in which we can actually be the church. People are so scared and they are starving. It is a famine in the land of spiritual truth. It's a famine in the land of hope. It's a famine in the land of confidence of the future. People are starving for the goodness of God. And if we're willing to go out, if we're willing to go out and just eat and sit and be with them, and then share the goodness of God. Could it be that God would do a new thing if we would be the church that goes instead of the church that gets comfortable as we stay? And so as we're doing this, one of the things the Lord says, we have to kill our comfort born out of convenience, our, our hunger for convenience, complacency, and control. That the Holy Spirit's going to be doing some things that maybe we haven't experienced before. He's going to be taking us places we've never gone before. But if we look at this and going, no, the old wine is better. We will never taste the new wine. And the outpouring of God will be poured on those around us, but not on us. In church, that is not God's heart. I want to bring us back to the fullness of 1 Peter 2, 9 through 25. And I just want to read it to you. They stumble because they disobey the word. The word of the Lord has gone out. We are called to the places we have never conquered, the promised land that we have never seen. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That you may proclaim the excellencies, the goodness, the glory, the miraculous, the healing, the provision. That you may proclaim everything he's ever done and promised to do to those who are in darkness because he's called you out of darkness. Like Levi at the tax booth because he was called by this great rabbi. He left everything behind. And in this season, Jesus is calling us. He's calling us. He's wooing us with, a, with a words of love, not of condemnation. Do this or die. He's calling us. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're, you're my personal possession. I sent my only son to die for you. And I sent my Holy Spirit this day of Pentecost we're talking about. I empowered you with the kingdom of God. The fullness of who I am lives inside of you, begging you to come forward to see the goodness of what I have for you to live by joy and promise out of the word of God to speak hope against hope like it talks in, in uh, Romans of Abraham who even though he considered his body no good and Sarah's no good he believed the word of God and never wavered and God accounted that to him as righteousness and he bore a son against hope he hoped he's calling us to be a people that could speak hope in the midst of times where there is no hope where the images on the media on social media the things people are talking about speak of death and no return of a brokenness of a country that could never be restored and God is calling us not to necessarily fight against those things directly but to go to individuals and go to the context of influence we have wherever we're at and speak hope in life, share a meal, love on someone, give someone help, be a sounding board for people's hurts and pray with people that you may declare the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light because once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles, more than Americans, you, you are God's people just passing through this country in this time of, of the world's history. But God has called you to a permanent kingship, a permanent, I mean, sonship in his kingdom, that you are children of the kingdom of God before you we're Americans. This doesn't mean that we can't protest, that we can't lobby, that we can't we can't go out, but never at the sake of forgetting who we are and first placing who we are as children of God, that I should love first and defend rights second. That I should love first and fight for my rights and my privileges second. And the both can be done at the same time, but they have to be done in love. And love has to be the primary subject of goal and the means that gets us there and the reason we start from the very beginning. And so 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of your flesh. Don't get riled up with hate along with the world. Don't get riled up with conspiracy along with the world. Don't get riled up with all the fear and worry and anxiety along with the world. But abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage, wage war against your soul. When we lose peace, it's because we've allowed these things to take our eyes, Taylor said, and it gets our eye off of Jesus and it wages war against your soul. It could be right. You may be right. But if it's not being guided and ruled and, and governed by love, it wages war against your soul. The facts, whether true or not, if they are not in the hands of a loving Savior, still wage war against your soul. It's something we need to understand. The truth of factual experience in the natural, while it is true, can wage war against your soul if it's not given over to the hands of our loving Father. Keep your conduct, it says, going on in verse 12, keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, which they will, as we continue to proclaim the goodness of God, they will more and more. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. When he comes to them, when he calls them, when he calls and says, I have bore you on my wings of an eagle, they will go, yes, and I saw it in your children. And so I receive you now. Be subject to the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise all who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. This is our primary objective. And again, as Americans, we have the right, if we feel that we're being unjustly dealt with, we have due process and rights in this country, and I encourage you to take them. But as a people of God, our prayers, our thoughts, our intentions, and our direction of our life should always start with doing good to others out of submission to the government at hand, unless it comes against the law of God. And so today I want to encourage us that there is much to be done good that we are not quelched in this time of stay-at-home orders. We still aren't going to do church service as we know it, although we are getting together at four to pray, but just to pray, to, to follow as best we can the guidelines that our governors put before us to keep each other safe, regardless of how we feel with that, but to do it in honor of the government in front of us. But we do know that it's a season to come together to start to pray, to start to reach out, to start to heal by loving and giving. And so we're going to come together and pray. And I just want to encourage you guys uh, in the midst of this season that the Lord can do a new thing. But church isn't going to look the same. The wineskin, Sunday service, programs, those things are all fine. And they may look the same, but we have to understand that if God's going to pour something out on us, we have to make some changes. I don't know what those changes are, and that's part of why we're going to come together to pray to pray for our government, to pray for our land, to pray for each other, to pray for the lost in our community, and to pray for the church to know, okay, Lord, you're doing a new thing. It is very clear in this season. There is, now I don't believe a revival, but I believe a reformation of what the Lord said in January of 2020 vision that a new, an eye realigned on him and realigned on the lost that we'll see clearly God well and see others well as God does. And that that isn't just revival, it is reformation. The things that have been lost in our culture, the church culture. We can blame the United States, but we have to hold ourselves accountable for where we have gone as a church. And I'm not speaking to every church or every individual in the church, but as a broad stroke that the Church of America, and to some degree City Church, has become complacent with just receiving Sunday service or having a Bible study once a week and never letting the truth of God be the thing that carries us on the wings of eagles, that brings us to the place of having compassion for the broken and preaching the gospel without fear. I want to leave you with a story of encouragement before we meet together tonight to pray. Last Summer and fall, the last year and a half, we've been talking a lot about Reach Our Neighbors, and we had a very specific directive. I don't remember when to go and pray for four neighbors in your neighborhood. As I set out to do this, one of my neighbors across the street, about my age, um, very different political view than me, very different lifestyle than my wife and I, but we get along nonetheless. We always found common ground, taking each other's gifts. They've brought me bread. Um, I've brought them things as well. We've helped each other out with projects around the house. We've grown this relationship of mutual respect, even though we know there's a vast difference in our belief systems. 
when I went over to pray for them, I met the husband out in his backyard and we were talking. I offered to pray for him. And I shared this story at church, but I'll share it to you in its wholeness again, just so you can remember. And we, he was throwing the ball for his dog and we're talking. I asked if he could pray for me. He said, nah, I'm, I'm good. I don't really pray. And then I said, okay, are you sure there's just nothing that if the Lord did anything in your life right now, what would it be? And he got choked up and he said, my wife and I have been trying to have a baby for years and we can't because she, her uterus, as the doctor said, is basically like a paved parking lot. Every time she had uh, uh, a, a womanly function, every time she had a period, uh, that section of her uterus would harden and would be infertile and no baby could plant. And at this point in our 30s, the doctor said that there's very little to no chance of her ever having children and we should probably start considering other forms of creating a family. And he had tears in his eyes, not quite crying, but they were starting to well up. And I said, well, let's pray for that because I believe my God does miracles. And so I laid my hand on your shoulder and we prayed real short, real simple. I didn't have profound words. I didn't have a prophetic utterance. I just cried out to God. And, and since that day, for the last however many months it's been, often when I look at their house, I pray for them. And this last week, his wife, he's out of town. His wife texted me, asked if they could borrow my lawn, or my lawnmower because theirs broke. And so I said, yes, and we met. And I pushed the lawnmower over and we met on their side of the property. And she goes, guess what? I'm seven weeks pregnant. And I started to cry and I just hugged her. Uh, and for those of you who know my airline story, it did not go down that way. It was a clean hug, no accidental kiss this time. <laughs> That's a story. For those of you who don't know, it's a funny story from another time. I said, you're kidding me. And she goes, yeah. And I said, did your husband, did he ever tell you what happened in your yard a few months back? She goes, he did. And this is crazy. And I go, oh, God is so good. And I said, I'm hugging you again. And I grabbed her and squeezed her again. And I said, we're going to pray right now. And she started to talk. And I just put my hand on her shoulder and started to pray protection and life over that child. You see, God is still in the business of doing new things, but I had to create a new wineskin and not just be the person who preaches the gospel on Sundays to people who already believe, but take a deep breath, face my fear, step forward in courage with a faith that going, God can do anything and pray for neighbors who don't believe in God, who don't believe in my value system and pray for them anyways and see if God would show up and God did. And I know that God's gonna do this for us as we move forward as a church, that this is the promises of God. If the old covenant had a certain promises, the New Testament tells us that our new covenant is based on better promises and they're all yes and amen in Jesus. The old covenant said that there would be no miscarriages and no barrenness. And this neighbor of mine who doesn't believe in God can see the goodness of God through the prayer of a weak man who came just in, in faith to pray from. Then he can do the same thing for you. He can change your neighborhood. He can change your family. If we be a people willing to change what we think needs to happen because it's what we've only known before. If we're willing to step out into the newness of God to create new wineskins and come together and pray and go, God, I want worship service to go back the way it was because I loved it how it was. And the idea of something new, what if we don't have certain aspects? What if we go, God, if you're going to do something greater, I'm willing to give up all that I knew. This is the beauty of Pentecost. The, the wind of the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Lord can come and baptize us with fire to go out and be the people we were created to be to experience the joy we were created to experience, to be the world changers that we were called to be, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, to declare the excellence of him to the whole world. The promise of Abraham is that all nations would be blessed. Can we be a people that where everyone in Spokane is blessed because of the power of God moving through the church? Not just city church, not a branded church, but be through the whole church, that we'd serve the church, we'd serve the lost, we'd serve each other. In such a way, we'd step forward in faith, take that deep breath of courage, and just remember what the Lord told Joshua, that it speaks, that it was written not for his sake, but it's written for ours. As, as what was written for Abraham was not written for his sake, Paul says, but it was written for ours. That we would only be strong and courageous, remember the word of the Lord, and only be strong and courageous. That we're called into a time such as this, not to cower in fear or to revolt in anger, but to be salt and light and to bring healing and hope to a land that is parched and dry, where widows are dying, where where men are being killed mercilessly in the streets for no reason because of the color of their skin, where people are divided over a virus that has no discrimination on who it's going to affect and how it's going to uh, devastate their lives for now and who knows how far along it will. Can we be a people who stand in the gap and pray and love relentlessly for our neighbors and for this nation? Can you join me this Sunday? Can you join me tonight? at 4 p.m. to seek the Lord, just to come and seek his face, to see if the God of Israel 
is really doing a new thing. And can we bring everything we had hoped for, our preconceived notions and our prejudices, and lay them at the door and just allow the Lord to speak to us as individuals and as a church and as a city and as a nation to see what he wants to do in this future. 2020 has sucked, but it's going to have a great end if we rise up and meet God where his promises are. I love you and I look forward to seeing you all at City Church at 4 p.m. tonight. God bless.